Chapter 16 At 7.30 Brother Jack and some of the others picked me up and we shot up to Harlem in a taxi. As before, no one spoke a word. There was only the sound made by a man in the corner who drew noisily on a pipe full of rum-flavored tobacco, causing it to glow on and off, a red disc in the dark. I rode with mounting nervousness, the taxi seemed unnaturally warm. We got out in a side street and went down a narrow alley in the dark to the rear of the huge, barn-like building. Other members had already arrived. Ah, here we are, Brother Jack said, leading the way through a dark rear door to a dressing room lighted by naked, low-hanging bulbs, a small room with wooden benches and a row of steel lockers with a network of names scratched on the doors. It had a football locker smell of ancient sweat, iodine blood and rubbing alcohol, and I felt a welling up of memories. We remain here until the building fills, Brother Jack said. Then we make our appearance, just at the height of their impatience. He gave me a grin. Meanwhile, you think about what you'll say. Did you look over the material? All day, I said. Good. I suggest, however, that you listen carefully to the rest of us. We'll all precede you so that you can get pointers for your remarks. You'll be last. I nodded, seeing him take two of the other men by the arm and retreat to a corner. I was alone, the others were studying their notes, talking. I went across the room to a torn photograph tacked to the faded wall. It was a shot, in fighting stance, of a former prize fight champion, a popular fighter who had lost his sight in the ring. It must have been right here in this arena. I thought. That had been years ago. The photograph was that of a man so dark and battered that he might have been of any nationality. Big and loose muscled, he looked like a good man. I remembered my father's story of how he had been beaten blind in a crooked fight, of the scandal that had been suppressed, and how the fighter had died in a home for the blind. Who would have thought I'd ever come here? How things were twisted around. I felt strangely sad and went and slouched on a bench. The others talked on, their voices low. I watched them with a sudden resentment. Why did I have to come last? What if they bored the audience to death before I came on? I'd probably be shouted down before I could get started. But perhaps not, I thought, jabbing my suspicions away. Perhaps I could make an effect through the sheer contrast between my approach and theirs. Maybe that was the strategy. Anyway, I had to trust them. I had to. Still a nervousness clung to me. I felt out of place. From beyond the door I could hear a distant scrape of chairs, a murmur of voices. Little worries whirled up within me, that I might forget my new name, that I might be recognized from the audience. I bent forward, suddenly conscious of my legs in new blue trousers. But how do you know they're your legs? What's your name? I thought, making a sad joke with myself. It was absurd, but it relieved my nervousness. For it was as though I were looking at my own legs for the first time, independent objects that could of their own volition lead me to safety or danger. I stared at the dusty floor. Then it was as though I were returning after a long suspension of consciousness, as though I stood simultaneously at opposite ends of a tunnel. I seemed to view myself from the distance of the campus while yet sitting there on a bench in the old arena, dressed in a new blue suit, sitting across the room from a group of intense men who talked among themselves in hushed, edgy voices, while yet in the distance I could hear the clatter of chairs, more voices, a cough. I seemed aware of it all from a point deep within me, yet there was a disturbing vagueness about what I saw, a disturbing unformed quality. As when you see yourself in a photo exposed during adolescence, the expression empty, the grin without character, the ears too large, the pimples, courage bumps, too many and too well defined. This was a new phase, I realized, a new beginning, and I would have to take that part of myself that looked on with remote eyes and keep it always at the distance of the campus, the hospital machine, the battle royal, all now far behind. Perhaps the part of me that observed listlessly but saw all, missing nothing, was still the malicious, arguing part, the dissenting voice, my grandfather part, the cynical, disbelieving part, the traitor self that always threatened internal discord. Whatever it was, 
I knew that I'd have to keep it pressed down. I had to. For if I were successful tonight, I'd be on the road to something big. No more flying apart at the seams, no more remembering forgotten pains. No, I thought, shifting my body, they're the same legs on which I've come so far from home. And yet they were somehow new. The new suit imparted a newness to me. It was the clothes and the new name and the circumstances. It was a newness too subtle to put into thought, but there it was. I was becoming someone else. I sensed vaguely and with a flash of panic that the moment I walked out upon the platform and opened my mouth I'd be someone else. Not just a nobody with a manufactured name which might have belonged to anyone, or to no one. But another personality. Few people knew me now, but after tonight. How was it? Perhaps simply to be known, to be looked upon by so many people, to be the focal point of so many concentrating eyes, perhaps this was enough to make one different, enough to transform one into something else, someone else, just as by becoming an increasingly larger boy one became one day a man, a man with a deep voice, although my voice had been deep since I was twelve. But what if someone from the campus wandered into the audience? or someone from Mary's, even Mary herself? No, it wouldn't change it, I heard myself say softly, that's all past. My name was different, I was under orders. Even if I met Mary on the street, I'd have to pass her by unrecognized. A depressing thought, and I got up abruptly and went out of the dressing room and into the alley. Without my overcoat it was cold. A feeble light burned above the entrance, sparkling the snow. I crossed the alley to the dark side, stopping near a fence that smelled of carbolic acid, which, as I looked back across the alley, caused me to remember a great abandoned hole that had been the site of a sports arena that had burned before my birth. All that was left, a cliff drop of some forty feet below the heat-buckled walk, was the shell of concrete with weirdly bent and rusted rods that had been its basement. The hole was used for dumping and after a rain it stank with stagnant water. And now in my mind I stood upon the walk looking out across the hole past a Hooverville shanty of packing cases and bent tin signs, to a railroad yard that lay beyond. Dark depthless water lay without motion in the hole, and past the Hooverville a switch engine idled upon the shining rails, and as a plume of white steam curled slowly from its funnel I saw a man come out of the shanty and start up the path which led to the walk above. Stooped and dark and sprouting rags from his shoes, hat and sleeves, he shuffled slowly toward me, bringing a threatening cloud of carbolic acid. It was a syphilitic who lived alone in the shanty between the hole and the railroad yard, coming up to the street only to beg money for food and disinfectant with which to soak his rags. Then in my mind I saw him stretching out a hand from which the fingers had been eaten away and I ran, back to the dark, and the cold and the present. I shivered, looking toward the street, where up the alley through the tunneling dark, three mounted policemen loomed beneath the circular, snow-sparkling beam of the street lamp, grasping their horses by their bridles, the heads of both men and animals bent close, as though plotting, the leather of saddles and leggings shining three white men and three black horses. Then a car passed and they showed in full relief, their shadows flying like dreams across the sparkle of snow and darkness. And, as I turned to leave, one of the horses violently tossed its head and I saw the gauntleted fist yanked down. Then there was a wild neigh and the horse plunged off in the dark, the crisp, frantic clanking of metal and the stomping of hooves followed me to the door. Perhaps this was something for Brother Jack to know. But inside they were still in a huddle, and I went back and sat on the bench. I watched them, feeling very young and inexperienced and yet strangely old, with an oldness that watched and waited quietly within me. Outside, the audience had begun to drone, a distant, churning sound that brought back some of the terror of the eviction. My mind flowed. There was a child standing in rompers outside a chicken wire fence, looking in upon a huge black and white dog, log chained to an apple tree. It was Master, the bulldog, and I was the child who was afraid to touch him, although, panting with heat, he seemed to grin back at me like a fat good-natured man, the saliva roping silvery from his jowls. 
and as the voices of the crowd churned and mounted and became an impatient splatter of hand claps, I thought of Master's low hoarse growl. He had barked the same note when angry or when being brought his dinner, when lazily snapping flies, or when tearing an intruder to shreds. I liked, but didn't trust old Master, I wanted to please, but did not trust the crowd. Then I looked at Brother Jack and grinned, that was it, in some ways, he was like a toy bull terrier. But now the roar and clapping of hands became a song and I saw Brother Jack break off and bounce to the door. Okay, brothers, he said, that's our signal. We went in a bunch, out of the dressing room and down a dim passage roar with the distant sound. Then it was brighter and I could see a spotlight blazing the smoky haze. We moved silently. Brother Jack following two very black negroes and two white men who led the procession, and now the roar of the crowd seemed to rise above us, flaring louder. I noticed the others falling into columns of four, and I was alone in the rear, like the pivot of a drill team. Ahead, a slanting shaft of brightness marked the entrance to one of the levels of the arena, and now as we passed it the crowd let out a roar. Then swiftly we were in the dark again, and climbing the roar seeming to sink below us and we were moved into a bright blue light and down a ramp, to each side of which, stretching away in a curve, I could see rows of blurred faces, then suddenly I was blinded and felt myself crash into the man ahead of me. It always happens the first time, he shouted, stopping to let me get my balance, his voice small in the roar. It's the spotlight. It had picked us up now, and, beaming just ahead, led us into the arena and encircled us full in its beam, the crowd thundering. The song burst forth like a rocket to the marching tempo of clapping hands, John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave John Brown's body lies a moldering in the grave, his soul is marching on. Imagine that, I thought, they make the old song sound new. At first I was as remote as though I stood in the highest balcony looking on. Then I walked flush into the vibrations of the voices and felt an electric tingling along my spine. We marched toward a flag-draped platform set near the front of the arena, moving through an aisle left between rows of people in folding chairs, then onto the platform past a number of women who stood when we came on. With a nod Brother Jack indicated our chairs and we faced the applause standing. Below and above us was the audience, row after row of faces, the arena a bowl-shaped aggregation of humanity. Then I saw the policeman and was disturbed. What if they recognized me? They were all along the wall. I touched the arm of the man ahead, seeing him turn, his mouth halting in a verse of the song. Why all the police? I said, leaning forward on the back of his chair. Cops? Don't worry. Tonight they're ordered to protect us. This meeting is of great political consequence. He said, turning away. Who ordered them to protect us? I thought, but now the song was ending and the building rang with applause, yells, until the chant burst from the rear and spread, no more dispossessing of the dispossessed. No more dispossessing of the dispossessed. The audience seemed to have become one, its breathing and articulation synchronized. I looked at Brother Jack. He stood up front beside a microphone, his feet planted solidly on the dirty canvas-covered platform, looking from side to side, his posture dignified and benign, like a bemused father listening to the performance of his adoring children. I saw his hand go up in a salute, and the audience thundered. And I seemed to move in close, like the lens of a camera focusing into the scene and feeling the heat and excitement and the pounding of voice and applause against my diaphragm, my eyes flying from face to face, swiftly, fleetingly, searching for someone I could recognize, for someone from the old life, and seeing the faces become vaguer and vaguer the farther they receded from the platform. The speeches began. First an invocation by a Negro preacher, then the woman spoke of what was happening to the children. Then came speeches on various aspects of the economic and political situation. I listened carefully, trying to snatch a phrase here, a word there, from the arsenal of hard, precise terms. It was becoming a high-keyed evening. Songs flared between speeches, 
chants exploded as spontaneously as shouts at a southern revival. And I was somehow attuned to it all, could feel it physically. Sitting with my feet on the soiled canvas I felt as though I had wandered into the percussion section of a symphony orchestra. It worked on me so thoroughly that I soon gave up trying to memorize phrases and simply allowed the excitement to carry me along. Someone pulled on my coat sleeve, my turn had come. I went toward the microphone where Brother Jack himself waited, entering the spot of light that surrounded me like a seamless cage of stainless steel. I halted. The light was so strong that I could no longer see the audience, the bowl of human faces. It was as though a semi-transparent curtain had dropped between us, but through which they could see me, for they were applauding, without themselves being seen. I felt the hard, mechanical isolation of the hospital machine and I didn't like it. I stood, barely hearing Brother Jack's introduction. Then he was through and there was an encouraging burst of applause. And I thought, they remember, some of them were there. The microphone was strange and unnerving. I approached it incorrectly, my voice sounding raspy and full of air, and after a few words I halted, embarrassed. I was getting off to a bad start, something had to be done. I leaned toward the vague audience closest to the platform and said, Sorry, folks. Up to now they've kept me so far away from these shiny electric gadgets I haven't learned the technique. And to tell you the truth, it looks to me like it might bite. Just look at it. It looks like the steel skull of a man. Do you think he died of dispossession? It worked and while they laughed someone came and made an adjustment. Don't stand too close, he advised. How's that? I said, hearing my voice boom deep and vibrant over the arena. Is that better? There was a ripple of applause. You see, all I needed was a chance. You've granted it, now it's up to me. The applause grew stronger and from down front a man's far-carrying voice called out, We with you, brother. You pitch em we catch em. That was all I needed, I'd made a contact, and it was as though his voice was that of them all. I was wound up, nervous. I might have been anyone, might have been trying to speak in a foreign language. For I couldn't remember the correct words and phrases from the pamphlets. I had to fall back upon tradition and since it was a political meeting, I selected one of the political techniques that I'd heard so often at home, the old down-to-earth, I'm sick and tired of the way they've been treating us approach. I couldn't see them so I addressed the microphone and the cooperative voice before me. You know, there are those who think we who are gathered here are dumb, I shouted. Tell me if I'm right. That's a strike, brother, the voice called. You pitched a strike. Yes, they think we're dumb. They call us the common people. But I've been sitting here listening and looking and trying to understand what's so common about us. I think they're guilty of a gross misstatement of fact, we are the uncommon people. Another strike, the voice called in the thunder, and I paused holding up my hand to halt the noise. Yes, we're the uncommon people, and I'll tell you why. They call us dumb and they treat us dumb. And what do they do with dumb ones? Think about it, look around. They've got a slogan and a policy. They've got what Brother Jack would call a theory and a practice. It's never give a sucker an even break. It's dispossess him. Evict him. Use his empty head for a spittoon and his back for a doormat. It's break him. Deprive him of his wages. It's use his protest as a sounding brass to frighten him into silence. It's beat his ideas and his hopes and homely aspirations, into a tinkling symbol. A small, cracked symbol to tinkle on the 4th of July. Only muffle it. Don't let it sound too loud. Beat it in stop time, give the dumb bunnies the soft shoe dance. The big wormy apple, the Chicago getaway, the shoe fly don't bother me. And do you know what makes us so uncommon? I whispered hoarsely. We let them do it. The silence was profound. The smoke boiled in the spotlight. Another strike, I heard the voice call sadly. Ain't no use to protest the decision. And I thought, is he with me or against me? Dispossession. Dispossession is the word. I went on. They've tried to dispossess us of our manhood and womanhood. Of our childhood and adolescence, you heard the sisters' statistics on our infant mortality rate. 
Don't you know you're lucky to be uncommonly born? Why, they even tried to dispossess us of our dislike of being dispossessed. And I'll tell you something else, if we don't resist, pretty soon they'll succeed. These are the days of dispossession, the season of homelessness, the time of evictions. We'll be dispossessed of the very brains in our heads. And we're so uncommon that we can't even see it. Perhaps we're too polite. Perhaps we don't care to look at unpleasantness. They think we're blind, uncommonly blind. And I don't wonder. Think about it, they've dispossessed us each of one eye from the day we were born. So now we can only see in straight white lines. We're a nation of one-eyed mice, did you ever see such a sight in your life? Such an uncommon sight. An ain't a farmer's wife in the house, the voice called through the titters of bitter laughter. It's another strike. I leaned forward. You know, if we aren't careful, they'll slip up on our blind sides and, plop. Out goes our last good eye and we're blind as bats. Someone's afraid we'll see something. Maybe that's why so many of our fine friends are present tonight, blue steel pistols and blue serge suits and all, but I believe one eye is enough to lose without resistance and I think that's your belief. So let's get together. Did you ever notice? My dumb one-eyed brothers, how two totally blind men can get together and help one another along. They stumble, they bump into things, but they avoid dangers too, they get along. Let's get together, uncommon people. With both our eyes we may see what makes us so uncommon, we'll see who makes us so uncommon. Up to now we've been like a couple of one-eyed men walking down opposite sides of the street. Someone starts throwing bricks and we start blaming each other and fighting among ourselves? But we're mistaken. Because there's a third party present. There's a smooth, oily scoundrel running down the middle of the wide grey street throwing stones, he's the one. He's doing the damage. He claims he needs the space, he calls it his freedom. And he knows he's got us on our blind side and he's been popping away till he's got us silly, uncommonly silly. In fact, in fact, his freedom has got us damn nigh blind. Hush now, don't call no names. I called, holding up my palm. I say to hell with this guy. I say come on, cross over. Let's make an alliance. I'll look out for you, and you look out for me. I'm good at catching and I've got a damn good pitching arm. You don't pitch no balls, brother. Not a single one. Let's make a miracle, I shouted. Let's take back our pillaged eyes. Let's reclaim our sight, let's combine and spread our vision. Peep around the corner, there's a storm coming. Look down the avenue, there's only one enemy. Can't you see his face? It was a natural pause and there was applause, but as it burst I realized that the flow of words had stopped. What would I do when they started to listen again? I leaned forward, straining to see through the barrier of light. They were mine out there, and I couldn't afford to lose them. Yet I suddenly felt naked, sensing that the words were returning and that something was about to be said that I shouldn't reveal. Look at me. The words ripped from my solar plexus. I haven't lived here long. Times are hard, I've known despair. I'm from the south, and since coming here I've known eviction. I've come to distrust the world. But look at me now, something strange is happening. I'm here before you. I must confess. And suddenly Brother Jack was beside me, pretending to adjust the microphone. Careful now, he whispered. Don't end your usefulness before you've begun. I'm all right, I said, leaning toward the mic. May I confess? I shouted. You are my friends. We share a common disinheritance, and it's said that confession is good for the soul. Have I your permission? You're batting point five zero zero, brother, the voice called. There was a stir behind me. I waited until it was quiet and hurried on. Silence is consent, I said, so I'll have it out, I'll confess it. My shoulders were squared, my chin thrust forward and my eyes focused straight into the light. Something strange and miraculous and transforming is taking place in me right now. As I stand here before you. I could feel the words forming themselves, slowly falling into place. The light seemed to boil oh pleasantly, like liquid soap shaken gently in a bottle. 
Let me describe it. It is something odd. It's something that I'm sure I'd never experience anywhere else in the world. I feel your eyes upon me. I hear the pulse of your breathing. And now, at this moment, with your black and white eyes upon me, I feel. I feel. I stumbled in a stillness so complete that I could hear the gears of the huge clock mounted somewhere on the balcony gnawing upon time. What is it, son, what do you feel? A shrill voice cried. My voice fell to a husky whisper, I feel, I feel suddenly that I have become more human. Do you understand? More human. Not that I have become a man, for I was born a man. But that I am more human. I feel strong. I feel able to get things done. I feel that I can see sharp and clear and far down the dim corridor of history and in it I can hear the footsteps of militant fraternity. No, wait, let me confess. I feel the urge to affirm my feelings. I feel that here, after a long and desperate and uncommonly blind journey, I have come home. Home. With your eyes upon me I feel that I've found my true family. My true people my true country. I am a new citizen of the country of your vision, a native of your fraternal land. I feel that here tonight, in this old arena, the new is being born and the vital old revived. In each of you, in me, in us all. Sisters. Brothers. We are the true patriots. The citizens of tomorrow's world. We'll be dispossessed no more. The applause struck like a clap of thunder. I stood, transfixed unable to see, my body quivering with the roar. I made an indefinite movement. What should I do, wave to them? I faced the shouts, cheers, shrill whistling, my eyes burning from the light. I felt a large tear roll down my face and I wiped it away with embarrassment. Others were starting down. Why didn't someone help me get out of the spot before I spoiled everything? But with the tears came an increase of applause and I lifted my head, surprised, my eyes streaming. The sound seemed to roar up in waves. They had begun to stomp the floor and I was laughing and bowing my head now unashamed. It grew in volume, the sound of splitting wood came from the rear. I grew tired, but still they cheered until, finally, I gave up and started back toward the chairs. Red spots danced before my eyes. Someone took my hand, and leaned toward my ear. You did it, God damn it. You did it. And I was puzzled by the hot mixture of hate and admiration bursting through his words as I thanked him and removed my hand from his crushing grasp. Thanks, I said, but the others had raised them to the right pitch. I shuddered, he sounded as though he would like to throttle me. I couldn't see and there was much confusion and suddenly someone spun me around pulling me off balance, and I felt myself pressed against warm feminine softness, holding on. Oh, brother, brother! A woman's voice cried into my ear, little brother. And I felt the hot moist pressure of her lips upon my cheek. Blurred figures bumped about me. I stumbled as in a game of blind man's buff. My hands were shaken, my back pounded. My face was sprayed with the saliva of enthusiasm and I decided that the next time I stood in the spotlight it would be wise to wear dark glasses. It was a deafening demonstration. We left them cheering, knocking over chairs, stomping the floor. Brother Jack guided me off the platform. It's time we left, he shouted. Things have truly begun to move. All that energy must be organized. He guided me through the shouting crowd, hands continuing to touch me as I stumbled along. Then we entered the dark passage and when we reached the end the spots faded from my eyes and I began to see again. Brother Jack paused at the door. Listen to them, he said. Just waiting to be told what to do. And I could still hear the applause booming behind us. Then several of the others broke off their conversation and faced us, as the applause muffled down behind the closing door. Well, what do you think? Brother Jack said enthusiastically. How's that for a starter? There was a tense silence. I looked from face to face, black and white, feeling swift panic. They were grim. Well? Brother Jack said, his voice suddenly hard. I could hear the creaking of someone's shoes. Well? He repeated. Then the man with the pipe spoke up, 
a swift charge of tension building with his words. It was a most unsatisfactory beginning, he said quietly, punctuating the unsatisfactory with a stab of his pipe. He was looking straight at me and I was puzzled. I looked at the others. Their faces were noncommittal, stolid. Unsatisfactory. Brother Jack exploded. And what alleged process of thought led to that brilliant pronouncement? This is no time for cheap sarcasm, brother, the brother with the pipe said. Sarcasm? You made the sarcasm. No, it isn't a time for sarcasms nor for imbecilities. Nor for plain damn fooleries. This is a key moment in the struggle, things have just begun to move, and suddenly you are unhappy. You are afraid of success? What's wrong? Isn't this just what we've been working for? Again, ask yourself. You're the great leader. Look into your crystal ball. Brother Jack swore. Brothers. Someone said. Brother Jack swore and swung to another brother. You, he said to the husky man. Have you the courage to tell me what's going on here? Have we become a street corner gang? Silence. Someone shuffled his feet. The man with the pipe was looking now at me. Did I do something wrong? I said. The worst you could have done, he said coldly. Stunned, I looked at him wordlessly. Never mind, Brother Jack said, suddenly calm. Just what is the problem, brother? Let's have it out right here. Just what is your complaint? Not a complaint, an opinion. If we are still allowed to express our opinions, the brother with the pipe said. Your opinion, then, Brother Jack said. In my opinion the speech was wild, hysterical, politically irresponsible and dangerous, he snapped. And worse than that, it was incorrect. He pronounced incorrect as though the term described the most heinous crime imaginable, and I stared at him open-mouthed, feeling a vague guilt. So, Brother Jack said, looking from face to face, there's been a caucus and decisions have been made. Did you take minutes, Brother Chairman? Have you recorded your wise disputations? There was no caucus and the opinion still holds, the brother with the pipe said. No meeting, but just the same there has been a caucus and decisions have been reached even before the event is finished. But, brother, someone tried to intervene. A most brilliant, operation, brother Jack went on, smiling now. A consummate example of skilled theoretical Nijinsky's leaping ahead of history. But come down. Brothers, come down or you'll land on your dialectics, the stage of history hasn't built that far. The month after next, perhaps, but not yet. And what do you think, Brother Restrum? He asked, pointing to a big fellow of the shape and size of supercargo. I think the brother's speech was backward and reactionary. He said. I wanted to answer but could not. No wonder his voice had sounded so mixed when he congratulated me. I could only stare into the broad face with its hate-burning eyes. And you, Brother Jack said. I liked the speech, the man said, I thought it was quite effective. And you? Brother Jack said to the next man. I am of the opinion that it was a mistake. And just why? Because we must strive to reach the people through their intelligence. Exactly, the brother with the pipe said. It was the antithesis of the scientific approach. Ours is a reasonable point of view. We are champions of a scientific approach to society, and such a speech as we've identified ourselves with tonight destroys everything that has been said before. The audience isn't thinking, it's yelling its head off. Sure, it's acting like a mob, the big black brother said. Brother Jack laughed. And this mob, he said, is it a mob against us, or is it a mob for us? How do our muscle-bound scientists answer that? But before they could answer he continued, Perhaps you're right, perhaps it is a mob, but if it is, then it seems to be a mob that's simply boiling over to come along with us. And I shouldn't have to tell you theoreticians that science bases its judgments upon experiment. You're jumping to conclusions before the experiment has run its course. In fact, What's happening here tonight represents only one step in the experiment. The initial step, the release of energy. I can understand that it should make you timid, you're afraid of carrying through to the next step, because it's up to you to organize that energy. Well, 
it's going to be organized and not by a bunch of timid sideline theoreticians arguing in a vacuum, but by getting out and leading the people. He was fighting mad, looking from face to face, his red head bristling, but no one answered his challenge. It's disgusting, he said, pointing to me. Our new brother has succeeded by instinct where for two years your science has failed, and now all you can offer is destructive criticism. I beg to differ, the brother with the pipe said. To point out the dangerous nature of his speech isn't destructive criticism. Far from it. Like the rest of us, the new brother must learn to speak scientifically. He must be trained. So at last it occurs to you, brother Jack said, pulling down the corners of his mouth training. All is not lost. There's hope that our wild but effective speaker may be tamed. The scientists perceive a possibility. Very well, it has been arranged, perhaps not scientifically but arranged nevertheless. For the next few months our new brother is to undergo a period of intense study and indoctrination under the guidance of brother Hambro. That's right, he said, as I started to speak. I meant to tell you later. But that's a long time, I said. How am I going to live? Your salary will continue, he said. Meanwhile, you'll be guilty of no further unscientific speeches to upset our brother's scientific tranquility. In fact, you are to stay completely out of Harlem. Perhaps then we'll see if you brothers are as swift at organizing as you are at criticizing. It's your move, brothers. I think brother Jack is correct, a short, bald man said. And I don't think that we, of all people, should be afraid of the people's enthusiasm. What we've got to do is to guide it into channels where it will do the most good. The rest were silent, the brother with the pipe looking at me unbendingly. Come, brother Jack said. Let's get out of here. If we keep our eyes on the real goal our chances are better than ever before. And let's remember that science isn't a game of chess, although chess may be played scientifically. The other thing to remember is that if we are to organize the masses we must first organize ourselves. Thanks to our new brother, things have changed, we mustn't fail to make use of our opportunity. From now on it's up to you. We shall see, the brother with the pipe said. And as for the new brother, a few talks with brother Hambro wouldn't harm anyone. Hambro, I thought, going out, who the hell is he? I suppose I'm lucky they didn't fire me. So now I've got to go to school again. Out in the night the group was breaking up and Brother Jack drew me aside. Don't worry, he said. You'll find Brother Hambro interesting, and a period of training was inevitable. Your speech tonight was a test which you passed with flying colors, so now you'll be prepared for some real work. Here's the address, see Brother Hambro the first thing in the morning. He's already been notified. When I reached home, Tiredness seemed to explode within me. My nerves remained tense even after I had had a hot shower and crawled into bed. In my disappointment, I wanted only to sleep, but my mind kept wandering back to the rally. It had actually happened. I had been lucky and had said the right things at the right time and they had liked me. Or perhaps I had said the wrong things in the right places, whatever, they had liked it regardless of the brothers, and from now on my life would be different. It was different already. For now I realized that I meant everything that I had said to the audience, even though I hadn't known that I was going to say those things. I had intended only to make a good appearance, to say enough to keep the brotherhood interested in me. What had come out was completely uncalculated, as though another self within me had taken over and held forth. And lucky that it had, or I might have been fired. Even my technique had been different, no one who had known me at college would have recognized the speech. But that was as it should have been, for I was someone new, even though I had spoken in a very old-fashioned way. I had been transformed, and now, lying restlessly in bed in the dark, I felt a kind of affection for the blurred audience whose faces I had never clearly seen. They had been with me from the first word. They had wanted me to succeed, and fortunately I had spoken for them and they had recognized my words. I belonged to them. I sat up, grasping my knees in the dark as the thought struck home. Perhaps this was what was meant by being dedicated and set aside. Very well, if so, 
I accepted it. My possibilities were suddenly broadened. As a Brotherhood spokesman I would represent not only my own group but one that was much larger. The audience was mixed, their claims broader than race. I would do whatever was necessary to serve them well. If they could take a chance with me, then I'd do the very best that I could. How else could I save myself from disintegration? I sat there in the dark trying to recall the sequence of the speech. Already it seemed the expression of someone else. Yet I knew that it was mine and mine alone, and if it was recorded by a stenographer, I would have a look at it tomorrow. Words, phrases skipped through my mind, I saw the blue haze again. What had I meant by saying that I had become more human? Was it a phrase that I had picked up from some preceding speaker, or a slip of the tongue? For a moment I thought of my grandfather and quickly dismissed him. What had an old slave to do with humanity? Perhaps it was something that Woodridge had said in the literature class back at college. I could see him vividly, half drunk on words and full of contempt and exaltation, pacing before the blackboard talked with quotations from Joyce and Yates and Sean O'K.C., thin, nervous, neat, pacing as though he walked a high wire of meaning upon which no one of us would ever dare venture. I could hear him, Stephen's problem, like ours was not actually one of creating the uncreated conscience of his race, but of creating the uncreated features of his face. Our task is that of making ourselves individuals. The conscience of a race is the gift of its individuals who see, evaluate, record. We create the race by creating ourselves and then to our great astonishment we will have created something far more important, we will have created a culture. Why waste time creating a conscience for something that doesn't exist? For, you see, blood and skin do not think. But no, it wasn't Woodridge. More human. Did I mean that I had become less of what I was, less a Negro, or that I was less a being apart, less an exile from down home, the South? But all this is negative. To become less, in order to become more? Perhaps that was it, but in what way more human? Even Woodridge hadn't spoken of such things. It was a mystery once more, as at the eviction I had uttered words that had possessed me. I thought of Bledsoe and Norton and what they had done. By kicking me into the dark they'd made me see the possibility of achieving something greater and more important than I'd ever dreamed. Here was a way that didn't lead through the back door, a way not limited by black and white, but a way which, if one lived long enough and worked hard enough, could lead to the highest possible rewards. Here was a way to have a part in making the big decisions, of seeing through the mystery of how the country, the world, really operated. For the first time, lying there in the dark, I could glimpse the possibility of being more than a member of a race. It was no dream, the possibility existed. I had only to work and learn and survive in order to go to the top. Sure I'd study with Hambro, I'd learn what he had to teach and a lot more. Let tomorrow come. The sooner I was through with this hambro, the sooner I could get started with my work. Chapter 17 Four months later when Brother Jack called the apartment at midnight to tell me to be prepared to take a ride I became quite excited. Fortunately, I was awake and dressed, and when he drove up a few minutes later I was waiting expectantly at the curb. Maybe, I thought. As I saw him hunched behind the wheel in his topcoat, this is what I've been waiting for. How have you been, brother? I said, getting in. A little tired, he said. Not enough sleep, too many problems. Then, as he got the car underway, he became silent, and I decided not to ask any questions. That was one thing I had learned thoroughly. There must be something doing at the Thonian, I thought watching him staring at the road as though lost in thought. Maybe the brothers are waiting to put me through my paces. If so, fine, I've been waiting for an examination. But instead of going to the Thonian I looked out to discover that he had brought me to Harlem and was parking the car. We'll have a drink, he said, getting out and heading for where the neon-lighted sign of a bull's head announced the El Toro bar. I was disappointed. I wanted no drink. I wanted to take the next step that lay between me and an assignment. I followed him inside with a surge of irritation. The barroom was warm and quiet. 
The usual rows of bottles with exotic names were lined on the shelves, and in the rear, where four men argued in Spanish over glasses of beer, a jukebox, lit up green and red, played media loose. And as we waited for the bartender, I tried to figure the purpose of the trip. I had seen very little of Brother Jack after beginning my studies with Brother Hambro. My life had been too tightly organized. But I should have known that if anything was going to happen, Brother Hambro would have let me know. Instead, I was to meet him in the morning as usual. That Hambro, I thought, is he a fanatic teacher? A tall, friendly man, a lawyer and the Brotherhood's chief theoretician, he had proved to be a hard taskmaster. Between daily discussions with him and a rigid schedule of reading, I had been working harder than I'd ever found necessary at college. Even my nights were organized, every evening found me at some rally or meeting in one of the many districts, though this was my first trip to Harlem since my speech, where I'd sit on the platform with the speakers, making notes to be discussed with him the next day. Every occasion became a study situation, even the parties that sometimes followed the meetings. During these I had to make mental notes of the ideological attitudes revealed in the guests' conversations. But I had soon learned the method in it, not only had I been learning the many aspects of the Brotherhood's policy and its approach to various social groupings, but the city-wide membership had grown familiar with me. My part in the eviction was kept very much alive, and although I was under orders to make no speeches, I had grown accustomed to being introduced as a kind of hero. Yet it had been mainly a time for listening and, being a talker, I had grown impatient. Now I knew most of the Brotherhood arguments so well, those I doubted as well as those I believed, that I could repeat them in my sleep, but nothing had been said about my assignment. Thus I had hoped the midnight call meant some kind of action was to begin. Beside me, Brother Jack was still lost in thought. He seemed in no hurry to go elsewhere or to talk, and as the slow-motion bartender mixed our drinks I puzzled vainly as to why he had brought me here. Before me, in the panel where a mirror is usually placed, I could see a scene from a bullfight, the bolt charging close to the man and the man swinging the red cape in sculptured folds so close to his body that man and bull seemed to blend in one swirl of calm, pure motion. Pure grace, I thought looking above the bar to where, larger than life, the pink and white image of a girl smiled down from a summery beer add-on which a calendar said April 1. Then, as our drinks were placed before us, Brother Jack came alive, his mood changing as though in the instant he had settled whatever had been bothering him and felt suddenly free. Here, come back, he said, nudging me playfully. She's only a cardboard image of a cold steel civilization. I laughed, glad to hear him joking. And that? I said, pointing to the bullfight scene. Sheer barbarism, he said, watching the bartender and lowering his voice to a whisper. But tell me, how have you found your work with Brother Hambro? Oh, fine, I said. He's strict, but if I'd had teachers like him in college, I'd know a few things. He's taught me a lot but whether enough to satisfy the brothers who dislike my arena speech, I don't know. Shall we converse scientifically? He laughed, one of his eyes glowing brighter than the other. Don't worry about the brothers, he said. You'll do very well. Brother Hambro's reports on you have been excellent. Now, that's nice to hear, I dot said, aware now of another bullfight scene further down the bar in which the matador was being swept skyward on the black bull's horns. I've worked pretty hard trying to master the ideology. Master it, Brother Jack said, but don't overdo it. Don't let it master you. There is nothing to put the people to sleep like dry ideology. The ideal is to strike a medium between ideology and inspiration. Say what the people want to hear but say it in such a way that they'll do what we wish. He laughed. Remember too, that theory always comes after practice. Act first, theorize later, that's also a formula, a devastatingly effective one. He looked at me as though he did not see me and I could not tell whether he was laughing at me or with me. I was sure only that he was a laughing. Yes, I said, I'll try to master all that is required. You can, he said. 
and now you don't have to worry about the brother's criticism. Just throw some ideology back at them and they'll leave you alone, provided, of course, that you have the right backing and produce the required results. Another drink? Thanks, I've had enough. Are you sure? Sure. Good. Now to your assignment, tomorrow you are to become chief spokesman of the Harlem district. What? Yes. The committee decided yesterday. But I had no idea. You'll do all right. Now listen. You are to continue what you started at the eviction. Keep them stirred up. Get them active. Get as many to join as possible. You'll be given guidance by some of the older members, but for the time being you are to see what you can do. You will have freedom of action, and you will be under strict discipline to the committee. I see, I said. No, you don't quite see, he said, but you will. You must not underestimate the discipline, brother. It makes you answerable to the entire organization for what you do. Don't underestimate the discipline. It is very strict but within its framework you are to have full freedom to do your work. And your work is very important. Understand? His eyes seemed to crowd my face as I nodded yes. We'd better go now so that you can get some sleep, he said, draining his glass. You're a soldier now, your health belongs to the organization. I'll be ready, I said. I know you will. Until tomorrow then. You meet with the executive committee of the Harlem section at 9 a.m. You know the location, of course? No, brother, I don't. Oh? That's right, then you'd better come up with me for a minute. I have to see someone there and you can take a look at where you'll work. I'll drop you off on the way down, he said. The district offices were located in a converted church structure, the main floor of which was occupied by a pawn shop its window crammed with loot that gleamed dully in the darkened street. We took a stair to the third floor, entering a large room beneath a high gothic ceiling. It's down here, Brother Jack said, making for the end of the large room where I saw a row of smaller ones, only one of which was lighted. And now I saw a man appear in the door and limp forward. Evening, Brother Jack, he said. Why, Brother Tarp, I expected to find Brother Tabbit. I know. He was here but he had to leave, the man said. He left this envelope for you and said he'd call you later on tonight. Good, good, brother Jack said. Here, meet a new brother. Pleased to meet you, the brother said, smiling. I heard you speak at the arena. You really told him. Thanks, I said. So you liked it, did you, brother Tarp? Brother Jack said. The boy's all right with me the man said. Well, you're going to see a lot of him, he's your new spokesman. That's fine, the man said. Looks like we're going to get some changes made. Correct, Brother Jack said. Now let's take a look at his office and we'll be going. Sure, Brother, Tarp said, limping before me into one of the dark rooms and snapping on a light. This here is the one. I looked into a small office containing a flat-top desk with a telephone, a typewriter on its table, a bookcase with shelves of books and pamphlets, and a huge map of the world inscribed with ancient nautical signs and a heroic figure of Columbus to one side. If there's anything you need, just see Brother Tarp, Brother Jack said. He's here at all times. Thanks, I shall, I said. I'll get oriented in the morning. Yes, and we'd better go so you can get some sleep. Good night, Brother Tarp. See that everything is ready for him in the morning. He won't have to worry about a thing, brother. Good night. It's because we attract men like Brother Tarp there that we shall triumph, he said as we climbed into the car. He is old physically, but ideologically he's a vigorous young man. He can be depended upon in the most precarious circumstance. He sounds like a good man to have around, I said. You'll see he said and lapsed into a silence that lasted until we reached my door. The committee was assembled in the hall with the high gothic ceiling when I arrived, sitting in folding chairs around two small tables pushed together to form a unit. Well, Brother Jack said, you are on time. Very good, we favor precision in our leaders, brother, I shall always try to be on time, I said. Here he is, brothers and sisters, 
he said, your new spokesman. Now to begin. Are we all present? All except Brother Todd Clifton, someone said. His red head jerked with surprise. So? He'll be here, a young brother said. We were working until three this morning. Still, he should be on time, very well, Brother Jack said, taking out a watch, let us begin. I have only a little time here, but a little time is all that is needed. You all know the events of the recent period, and the role our new brother has played in them. Briefly, you are here to see that it isn't wasted. We must achieve two things, we must plan methods of increasing the effectiveness of our agitation, and we must organize the energy that has already been released. This calls for a rapid increase of membership. The people are fully aroused, if we fail to lead them into action, they will become passive, or they will become cynical. Thus it is necessary that we strike immediately and strike hard. For this purpose, he said, nodding toward me, our brother has been appointed district spokesman. You are to give him your loyal support and regard him as the new instrument of the committee's authority. I heard the slight applause splatter up, only to halt with the opening of the door, and I looked down past the rows of chairs to where a hatless young man about my own age was coming into the hall. He wore a heavy sweater and slacks, and as the others looked up I heard the quick intake of a woman's pleasurable sigh. Then the young man was moving with an easy negro stride out of the shadow into the light, and I saw that he was very black and very handsome, and as he advanced mid-distance into the room, that he possessed the chiseled, black marble features sometimes found on statues in northern museums and alive in southern towns in which the white offspring of house children and the black offspring of yard children bear names, features and character traits as identical as the rifling of bullets fired from a common barrel. And now close up, leaning tall and relaxed, his arms outstretched stiffly upon the table, I saw the broad, taut span of his knuckles upon the dark grain of the wood, the muscular, sweatered arms, the curving line of the chest rising to the easy pulsing of his throat, to the square, smooth chin, and saw a small X-shaped patch of adhesive upon the subtly blended, velvet over stone, granite over bone, Afro-Anglo-Saxon contour of his cheek. He leaned there, looking at us all with a remote aloofness in which I sensed an unstated questioning beneath a friendly charm. Sensing a possible rival, I watched him warily, wondering who he was. Also, Brother Todd Clifton is late, Brother Jack said. Our leader of the youth is late. Why is this? The young man pointed to his cheek and smiled. I had to see the doctor, he said. What is this? Brother Jack said, looking at the cross of adhesive on the black skin. Just a little encounter with the nationalists. With Ras the exhorter's boys, Brother Clifton said. And I heard a gasp from one of the women who gazed at him with shining, compassionate eyes. Brother Jack gave me a quick look. Brother, you have heard of Ras? He is the wild man who calls himself a black nationalist. I don't recall so, I said. You'll hear of him soon enough. Sit down, Brother Clifton, sit down. You must be careful. You are valuable to the organization, you must not take chances. This was unavoidable, the young man said. Just the same, Brother Jack said, returning to the discussion with a call for ideas. Brother, are we still to fight against evictions? I said. It has become a leading issue, thanks to you. Then why not step up the fight? He studied my face. What do you suggest? Well, since it has attracted so much attention, why not try to reach the whole community with the issue? And how would you suggest we go about it? I suggest we get the community leaders on record in support of us. There are certain difficulties in face of this, Brother Jack said. Most of the leaders are against us. But I think he's got something there, Brother Clifton said. What if we got them to support the issue whether they like us or not? The issue is a community issue, it's non-partisan. Sure, I said, that's how it looks to me. With all the excitement over evictions they can't afford to come out against us, not without appearing to be against the best interests of the community. So we have them across a barrel, Clifton said. That is perceptive enough, Brother Jack said. The others agreed. You see, 
Brother Jack said with a grin, we've always avoided these leaders, but the moment we start to advance on a broad front, sectarianism becomes a burden to be cast off. Any other suggestions? He looked around. Brother, I said, remembering now, when I first came to Harlem one of the first things that impressed me was a man making a speech from a ladder. He spoke very violently and with an accent, but he had an enthusiastic audience. Why can't we carry our program to the street in the same way? So you have met him, he said, suddenly grinning. Well, Ras the Exhorter has had a monopoly in Harlem. But now that we are larger we might give it a try. What the committee wants is results. So that was Ras the Exhorter, I thought. We'll have trouble with the extorter, I mean the exhorter, a big woman said. His hoodlums would attack and denounce the white meat of a roasted chicken. We laughed. He goes wild when he sees black people and white people together, she said to me. We'll take care of that, Brother Clifton said, touching his cheek. Very well, but no violence, Brother Jack said. The Brotherhood is against violence and terror and provocation of any kind, aggressive, that is. Understand, Brother Clifton? I understand, he said. We will not countenance any aggressive violence. Understand? nor attacks upon officials or others who do not attack us. We are against all forms of violence, do you understand? Yes, brother, I said. Very well, having made this clear I leave you now, he said. See what you can accomplish. You'll have plenty support from other districts and all the guidance you need. Meanwhile, remember that we are all under discipline. He left and we divided the labor. I suggested that each work in the area he knew best. Since there was no liaison between the Brotherhood and the community leaders I assigned myself the task of creating one. It was decided that our street meetings begin immediately and that Brother Todd Clifton was to return and go over the details with me. While the discussion continued I studied their faces. They seemed absorbed with the cause and in complete agreement, blacks and whites. But when I tried to place them as to type I got nowhere. The big woman who looked like a southern sudsbuster was in charge of women's work, and spoke in abstract, ideological terms. The shy-looking man with the liver splotches on his neck spoke with a bold directness and eagerness for action. And this brother Todd Clifton, the youth leader, looked somehow like a hipster, a zoot suitor, a sharpie except his head of Persian lamb's wool had never known a straightener. I could place none of them. They seemed familiar but were just as different as Brother Jack and the other whites were from all the white men I had known. They were all transformed, like familiar people seen in a dream. Well, I thought, I'm different too, and they'll see it when the talk is finished and the action begins. I'll just have to be careful not to antagonize anyone. As it is, someone might resent my being placed in charge. But when Brother Todd Clifton came into my office to discuss the street meeting I saw no signs of resentment, but a complete absorption in the strategy of the meeting. With great care he went about instructing me how to deal with hecklers, on what to do if we were attacked, and upon how to recognize our own members from the rest of the crowd. For all his seeming zoot suitor characteristics his speech was precise and I had no doubt that he knew his business. How do you think we'll do? I said when he had finished. It'll go big, man, he said. It'll be bigger than anything since Garvey. I wish I could be so sure, I said. I never saw Garvey. I didn't either, he said, but I understand that in Harlem he was very big. Well, we're not Garvey, and he didn't last. No, but he must have had something, he said with sudden passion. He must have had something to move all those people. Our people are hell to move. He must have had plenty. I looked at him. His eyes were turned inward, then he smiled. Don't worry, he said. We have a scientific plan and you set them off. Things are so bad they'll listen, and when they listen they'll go along. I hope so, I said. They will. You haven't been around the movement as I have, for three years now, and I can feel the change. They're ready to move. I hope your feelings are right, I said. They're right, all right, he said. All we have to do is gather them in. 
The evening was almost of the winter coldness, the corner well lighted and the all Negro crowd large and tightly packed. Up on the ladder now I was surrounded by a group of Clifton's youth division, and I could see, beyond their backs with upturned collars, the faces of the doubtful, the curious and the convinced in the crowd. It was early and I threw my voice hard down against the traffic sounds, feeling the damp coldness of the air upon my cheeks and hands as my voice warmed with my emotion. I had just begun to feel the pulsing set up between myself and the people, hearing them answering in staccato applause and agreement when Todd Clifton caught my eye, pointing. And over the heads of the crowd and down past the dark storefronts and blinking neon signs I saw a bristling band of about twenty men quick stepping forward. I looked down. It's trouble, keep talking, Clifton said. Give the boys the signal. My brothers, the time has come for action, I shouted. And now I saw the youth members and some older men move around to the back of the crowd and up to meet the advancing group. Then something sailed up out of the dark and landed hard against my forehead, and I felt the crowd surge in close, sending the ladder moving backwards, and I was like a man tottering above a crowd on stilts, then dropping backwards into the street and clear, hearing the ladder clatter down. They were milling in a panic now, and I saw Clifton beside me. It's Ras the Exhorter, he yelled. Can you use your hands? I can use my fists. I was annoyed. Well, all right then. Here's your chance. Come on, let's see you duke. He moved forward and seemed to dive into the whirling crowd, and I beside him, seeing them scatter into doorways and pound off in the dark. There's Ras, over there, Clifton cried. And I heard the sound of breaking glass and the street went dark. Someone had knocked out the light and through the dimness I saw Clifton heading to where a red neon sign glowed in a dark window as something went past my head. Then a man ran up with a length of pipe and I saw Clifton close with him, ducking down and working in close and grabbing the man's wrist and twisting suddenly like a soldier executing an about face so that now he faced me, the back of the man's elbow rigid across his shoulder and the man rising on tiptoe and screaming as Clifton straightened smoothly and levered down on the arm. I heard a dry popping sound and saw the man sag, and the pipe rang upon the walk, then someone caught me hard in the stomach and suddenly I knew that I was fighting too. I went to my knees and rolled and pulled erect, facing him. Get up, Uncle Tom, he said, and I clipped him. He had his hands and I had mine and the match was even but he was not so lucky. He wasn't down and he wasn't out, but I caught him two good ones and he decided to fight elsewhere. When he turned I tripped him and moved away. The fight was moving back into the dark where the street lights had been knocked out clear to the corner, and it was quiet except for the grunting and straining and the sound of footfalls and of blows. It was confusing in the dark and I couldn't tell ours from theirs and moved cautiously, trying to see. Someone up the street in the dark yelled, Break it up! Break it up! And I thought, cops, and looked around for Clifton. The neon sign glowed mysteriously and there was a lot of running and cursing, and now I saw him working skillfully in a store lobby before a red checks cash tier sign and I hurried over, hearing objects sailing past my head and the crash of glass. Clifton's arms were moving in short, accurate jabs against the head and stomach of Ras the Exhorter, punching swiftly and scientifically, careful not to knock him into the window or strike the glass with his fists, working Ras between rights and lefts jabbed so fast that he rocked like a drunken bull, from side to side. And as I came up Ras tried to bull his way out and I saw Clifton drive him back and down into a squat, his hands upon the dark floor of the lobby his heels back against the door like a runner against starting blocks. And now, shooting forward, he caught Clifton coming in, butting him, and I heard the burst of breath and Clifton was on his back and something flashed in Rass's hand and he came forward, a short, heavy figure as wide as the lobby now with the knife, moving deliberately. I spun, looking for the length of pipe, diving for it and crawling on hands and knees and here, here and coming up to see Ras reach down, getting one hand into Clifton's collar, the knife in the other, looking down at Clifton and panting, bull angry. I froze, 
seeing him draw back the knife and stop it in midair, draw back and stop, cursing, then draw back and stop again, all very quickly, beginning to cry now and talking rapidly at the same time, and me easing slowly forward. Man, Ras blurted, I ought to kill you. Godam, I ought to kill you and the world be better off. But you black, man. Why you be black, man? I swear I ought to kill you. No man strike the exhorter, go damn it, no man. I saw him raise the knife again and now as he lowered it unused he pushed Clifton into the street and stood over him, sobbing. Why you with these white folks? Why? I been watching you a long time. I say to myself, soon he get smart and get tired. He get out of that ding. Why a good boy like you still with them? Still moving forward. I saw his face gleam with red angry tears as he stood above Clifton with the still innocent knife and the tears red in the glow of the window sign. You my brother, man. Brothers are the same color, how the hell you call these white men brother? Shit, man. That's shit. Brothers the same color. We sons of Mama Africa, you done forgot? You black, black. You, Godam, man. He said swinging the knife for emphasis. You got bod hair. You got thick lips. They say you stink. They hate you, man. You African. African. Why you with them? Leave that shit, man. They sell you out. That shit is old-fashioned. They enslave us, you forget that? How can they mean a black man any good? How they going to be your brother? I had reached him now and brought the pipe down hard seeing the knife fly off into the dark as he grabbed his wrist, and I raised the pipe again, suddenly hot with fear and hate, as he looked at me out of his narrow little eyes, standing his ground. And you, man, the exhorter said, a regular little black devil. A go dim sly mongoose. Where you think you from, going with the white folks? I know, go dim, don't I know it. You from down south. You from Trinidad. You from Barbados, Jamaica, South Africa, and the white man's foot in your ass all the way to the hip. What you trying to deny by betraying the black people? Why you fight against us? You young fellows. You young black men with plenty education, I been hearing your rabble rousing. Why you go over to the enslaver? What kind of education is that? What kind of black man is that who betray his own mama? Shut up. Clifton said, leaping to his feet. Shut up. Hell, no, Ras cried, wiping his eyes with his fists. I talk. Bust me with the pipe but, by God, you listen to the exhorter. Come in with us, man. We build a glorious movement of black people. Black people. What they do, give you money. Who want the damn stuff? Their money bleed black blood, man. It's unclean. Taking their money is shit, man. Money without dignity, that spot shit. Clifton lunged toward him. I held him, shaking my head. Come on, the man's crazy, I said, pulling on his arm. Ras struck his thighs with his fists. Me crazy, man? You call me crazy? Look at you two and look at me, is this sanity? Standing here in three shades of blackness. Three black men fighting in the street because of the white enslaver? Is that sanity? Is that consciousness, scientific understanding? Is that the modern black man of the 20th century? Hell, man. Is it self-respect, black against black? What they give you to betray, their women. You fall for that? Let's go, I said, listening and remembering and suddenly alive in the dark with the horror of the battle royal. But Clifton looked at Ras with a tight, fascinated expression, pulling away from me. Let's go, I repeated. He stood there, looking. Sure, you go, Ras said, but not him. You contaminated but he the real black man. In Africa this man be a chief, a black king. Here they say he raped them Godam women with no blood in their veins. I bet this man can't beat them off with baseball bat, shit. What kind of foolishness is it? Kick him ass from cradle to grave then call him brother? Does it make mathematics? Is it logic? Look at him, man, open your eyes, he said to me. I look like that I rock the blusted world. 
They know about me in Japan, India, all the colored countries. Youth. Intelligence. The man's a natural prince. Where is your eyes? Where your self-respect? Working for them damn people? Their days is numbered, the time is almost here and you fooling round like this was the 19th century. I don't understand you. Am I ignorant? Answer me, man. Yes, Clifton burst out. Hell, yes. You think I'm crazy, is it got ace I speak bad English? Hell, it ain't my mama tongue, man, I'm African. You really think I'm crazy? Yes, yes. You believe that? Said Ras. What they do to you, black man? Give you them stinking women? Clifton lunged again, and again I grabbed him, and again Ras held his ground, his head glowing red. Women? Go dem, man. Is that equality? Is that the black man's freedom? A pat on the back and a piece of cunt without no passion? Maggots. They buy you that blast head cheap, man. What they do to my people? Where is your brains? These women dregs, man. They bilged water. You know the high class white man hates the black man, that's simple. So now he use the dregs and want you black young men to do his dirty work. They betray you and you betray the black people. They tricking you, man. Let them fight among themselves. Let them kill off one another. We organize, organization is good, but we organize black. Black. To hell with that son of a bitch. He take one them strumpets and tell the black man his freedom lie between her skinny legs, while that son of a gun, he take all the power and the capital and don't leave the black man nodding. The good white women he tell the black man is a rapist and keep them locked up and ignorant while he makes the black man a race of bastards. When the black man going to tire of this childish perfidity. He got you so you don't trust your black intelligence? You young, don't play self cheap, man. Don't deny self. It took a billion gallons of black blood to make you. Recognize self inside and you and the kings among men. A man knows he's a man when he got nothing, when he's naked, nobody have to tell him that. You six foot tall, man. You young and intelligent. You black and beautiful, don't let him tell you different. You wasn't them things you be dead, man. Dead. I'd have killed you, man. Ras the exhorter raised up his knife and tried to do it, but he could not do it. Why don't you do it? I ask myself. I will do it now, I say, but some metting tell me, no, no. You might be killing your black king, and I say, yes, yes. So I accept your humiliating ocean. Ras recognized your black possibilities, man. Ras would not sacrifice his black brother to the white enslaver. Instead he cry. Ras is a man, no white man have to tell him that, and Ras cry. So why don't you recognize your black duty? man, and come join us. His chest was heaving and a note of pleading had come into the harsh voice. He was an exhorter, all right, and I was caught in the crude, insane eloquence of his plea. He stood there, awaiting an answer. And suddenly a big transport plane came low over the buildings and I looked up to see the firing of its engine, and we were all three silent, watching. Suddenly the exhorter shook his fist toward the plane and yelled, Hell with him, some day we have them too. Hell with him. He stood there, shaking his fist as the plane rattled the buildings in its powerful flight. Then it was gone and I looked about the unreal street. They were fighting far up the block in the dark now and we were alone. I looked at the exhorter. I didn't know if I was angry or amazed. Look, I said, shaking my head, let's talk sense. From now on we'll be on the street corners every night and we'll be prepared for trouble. We don't want it, especially with you, but we won't run either. God damn, man, he said, leaping forward, this is Harlem. This is my territory, the black man's territory. You think we let white folks come in and spread their poison? Let them come in like they come and take over the numbers racket? Like they have all the stores? Talk sense. Man, if you talking to Ras, talk sense. This is sense, I said, and you listen as we listen to you. We'll be out here every night, understand? 
We'll be out here and the next time you go after one of our brothers with a knife, and I mean white or black, well, we won't forget it. He shook his head, nor will I forget you either, man. Don't. I don't want you to, because if you forget there'll be trouble. You're mistaken, don't you see you're outnumbered? You need allies to win. That there is sense. Black allies. Yellow and brown allies. All men who want a brotherly world, I said. Don't be stupid, man. They white, they don't have to be allies with no black people. They get what they want, they turn against you. Where's your black intelligence? Thinking like that will get you lost in the backwash of history, I said. Start thinking with your mind and not your emotions. He shook his head vehemently, looking at Clifton. This black man talking to me about brains and thinking. I ask both of you, are you awake or sleeping? What is your post and where are you going? Never mind, take your corrupt ideology and eat out your own guts like a laughing hyena. You are nowhere, man. Nowhere. Ras is not ignorant, nor is Ras afraid. No. Ras, he be here black and fighting for the liberty of the black people when the white folks have got what they want and done gone off laughing in your face and you stinking and choked up with white maggots. He spat angrily into the dark street. It flew pink in the red glow. That'll be all right with me, I said. Only remember what I said. Come on, Brother Clifton. This man's full of pus, black pus. We started away, a piece of glass crunching under my foot. Maybe so, Ras said, but I am no fool. I am no black educated fool who thinks everything between black man and white man can be settled with some blast head lies in some bloody books written by the white man in the first place. It's 300 years of black blood to build this white man's civilization and won't be wiped out in a minute. Blood calls for blood. You remember that. And remember that I am not like you. Ras recognizes the true issues and he is not afraid to be black. Nor is he a traitor for white men. Remember that, I am no black traitor to the black people for the white people. And before I could answer Clifton spun in the dark and there was a crack and I saw Ras go down and Clifton breathing hard and Ras lying there in the street, a thick, black man with red tears on his face that caught the reflection of the check's cash tear sign. And again, as Clifton looked gravely down he seemed to ask a silent question. Let's go, I said. Let's go. We started away as the screams of sirens sounded, Clifton cursing quietly to himself. Then we were out of the dark onto a busy street and he turned to me. There were tears in his eyes. That poor, misguided son of a bitch, he said. He thinks a lot of you, too, I said. I was glad to be out of the dark and away from that exhorting voice. The man's crazy, Clifton said. It'll run you crazy if you let it. Where'd he get that name? I said. He gave it to himself. I guess he did. Ras is a title of respect in the East. It's a wonder he didn't say something about Ethiopia stretching forth her wings, he said, mimicking Ras. He makes it sound like the hood of a cobra fluttering. I don't know. I don't know. We'll have to watch him now, I said. Yes, we'd better, he said. He won't stop fighting. And thanks for getting rid of his knife. You didn't have to worry, I said. He wouldn't kill his king. He turned and looked at me as though he thought I might mean it, then he smiled. For a while there I thought I was gone, he said. As we headed for the district office I wondered what Brother Jack would say about the fight. We'll have to overpower him with organization, I said. We'll do that, all right. But it's on the inside that Ras is strong, Clifton said. On the inside he's dangerous. He won't get on the inside, I said. He'd consider himself a traitor. No, Clifton said, he won't get on the inside. Did you hear how he was talking? Did you hear what he was saying? I heard him, sure, I said. I don't know, he said. I suppose sometimes a man has to plunge outside history. What? Plunge outside, turn his back. Otherwise he might kill somebody, go nuts. I didn't answer. Maybe he's right, I thought, and was suddenly very glad I had found brotherhood. 
The next morning it rained and I reached the district before the others arrived and stood looking through the window of my office, past the jutting wall of a building, and on beyond the monotonous pattern of its bricks and mortar I saw a row of trees rising tall and graceful in the rain. One tree grew close by and I could see the rain streaking its bark and its sticky buds. Trees were rowed the length of the long block beyond me, rising tall and dripping wetness above a series of cluttered backyards. And it occurred to me that cleared of its ramshackle fences and planted with flowers and grass, it might form a pleasant park. And just then a paper bag sailed from the window to my left and burst like a silent grenade, scattering garbage into the trees and pancaking to earth with a soggy, exhausted plop. I started with disgust, then thought, the sun will shine in those backyards someday. A community cleanup campaign might be worthwhile for a slack season, at that. Everything couldn't possibly be as exciting as last night. Turning back to my desk I sat facing the map now as Brother Tarp appeared. Morning, son, I see you already on the job, he said. Good morning. I have so much to do that I thought I'd better get started early, I said. You'll do all right, he said. But I didn't come in here to take up your time, I want to put something on the wall. Go right ahead. Can I give you a hand? No, I can make it all right, he said clambering with his lame leg upon a chair that sat beneath the map and hanging a frame from the ceiling molding, straightening it carefully, and getting down to come over beside my desk. Son, you know who that is? Why, yes, I said, it's Frederick Douglass. Yes sir, that's just who it is. You know much about him? Not much. My grandfather used to tell me about him though. That's enough. He was a great man. You just take a look at him once in a while. You have everything you need, paper and stuff like that? Yes, I have, Brother Tarp. And thanks for the portrait of Douglas. Don't thank me, son, he said from the door. He belongs to all of us. I sat now facing the portrait of Frederick Douglas, feeling a sudden piety, remembering and refusing to hear the echoes of my grandfather's voice. Then I picked up the telephone and began calling the community leaders. They fell in line like prisoners, preachers, politicians, various professionals, proving Clifton correct. The eviction fight was such a dramatic issue that most of the leaders feared that their followers would have rallied to us without them. I slighted no one, no matter how unimportant, big shots, doctors, real estate men and storefront preachers. And it went so fast and smoothly that it seemed not to happen to me but to someone who actually bore my new name. I almost laughed into the phone when I heard the director of men's house address me with profound respect. My new name was getting around. It's very strange, I thought, but things are so unreal for them normally that they believe that to call a thing by name is to make it so. And yet I am what they think I am. Our work went so well that a few Sundays later we threw a parade that clinched our hold on the community. We worked feverishly. And now the clashing and conflict of my last days at Mary's seemed to have moved out into the struggles of the community, leaving me inwardly calm and controlled. Even the hustle and bustle of picketing and speech-making seemed to stimulate me for the better, my wildest ideas paid off. Upon hearing that one of the unemployed brothers was an ex-drill master from Wichita, Kansas, I organized a drill team of six-footers whose duty it was to march through the streets striking up sparks with their hobnailed shoes. On the day of the parade they drew crowds faster than a dogfight on a country road. The People's Hot Foot Squad, we called them and when they drilled fancy formations down 7th Avenue in the springtime dusk they set the streets ablaze. The community laughed and cheered and the police were dumbfounded. But the sheer corn of it got them and the hot foot squad went shuffling along. Then came the flags and banners and the cards bearing slogans, and the squad of drum majorettes, the best looking girls we could find, who pranced and twirled and just plain girled in the enthusiastic interest of brotherhood. We pulled 15,000 Harlemites into the street behind our slogans and marched down Broadway to City Hall. Indeed, we were the talk of the town. With this success I was pushed forward at a dizzy pace. My name spread like smoke in an airless room. I was kept moving all over the place. 
speeches here, there, everywhere, uptown and down. I wrote newspaper articles, led parades and relief delegations, and so on. And the Brotherhood was going out of its way to make my name prominent. Articles, telegrams and many mailings went out over my signature, some of which I'd written, but most not. I was publicized, identified with the organization both by word and image in the press. On the way to work one late spring morning I counted 50 greetings from people I didn't know, becoming aware that there were two of me, the old self that slept a few hours a night and dreamed sometimes of my grandfather and Bledsoe and Brockway and Mary, the self that flew without wings and plunged from great heights, and the new public self that spoke for the Brotherhood and was becoming so much more important than the other that I seemed to run a foot race against myself. Still. I liked my work during those days of certainty. I kept my eyes wide and ears alert. The Brotherhood was a world within a world and I was determined to discover all its secrets and to advance as far as I could. I saw no limits, it was the one organization in the whole country in which I could reach the very top and I meant to get there. Even if it meant climbing a mountain of words. For now I had begun to believe, despite all the talk of science around me that there was a magic in spoken words. Sometimes I sat watching the watery play of light upon Douglas' portrait, thinking how magical it was that he had talked his way from slavery to a government ministry, and so swiftly. Perhaps, I thought, something of the kind is happening to me. Douglas came north to escape and find work in the shipyards, a big fellow in a sailor suit who, like me, had taken another name. What had his true name been? Whatever it was, it was as Douglas that he became himself, defined himself. And not as a boat right as he'd expected, but as an order. Perhaps the sense of magic lay in the unexpected transformations. You start Saul, and end up Paul, my grandfather had often said. When you're a young gun, you Saul, but let life whop your head a bit and you starts to trying to be Paul, though you still Saul's around on the side. No. You could never tell where you were going, that was a sure thing. The only sure thing. Nor could you tell how you'd get there, though when you arrived it was somehow right. For hadn't I started out with a speech, and hadn't it been a speech that won my scholarship to college, where I had expected speech-making to win me a place with Bledsoe and launch me finally as a national leader? Well, I had made a speech, and it had made me a leader, only not the kind I had expected. So that was the way it was. And no complaints, I thought, looking at the map, you started looking for red men and you found them, even though of a different tribe and in a bright new world. The world was strange if you stopped to think about it, still it was a world that could be controlled by science, and the Brotherhood had both science and history under control. Thus for one lone stretch of time I lived with the intensity displayed by those chronic numbers players who see clues to their fortune in the most minute and insignificant phenomena, in clouds, on passing trucks and subway cars, in dreams, comic strips, the shape of dog luck fouled on the pavements. I was dominated by the all-embracing idea of brotherhood. The organization had given the world a new shape, and me a vital role. We recognized no loose ends, everything could be controlled by our science. Life was all pattern and discipline, and the beauty of discipline is when it works. And it was working very well, Chapter 18. Only my blood so trusty inspired compulsion to read all papers that touched my hands prevented me from throwing the envelope aside. It was unstamped and appeared to be the least important item in the morning's mail, brother. This is advice from a friend who has been watching you closely. Do not go too fast. Keep working for the people but remember that you are one of us and do not forget if you get too big they will cut you down. You are from the south and you know that this is a white man's world. So take a friendly advice and go easy so that you can keep on helping the colored people. They do not want you to go too fast and will cut you down if you do. Be smart. I shot to my feet the paper rattling poisonously in my hands. What did it mean? Who'd send such a thing? Brother Tarp. I called, reading again the wavery lines of a handwriting that was somehow familiar. Brother Tarp. 
What is it, son? And looking up, I received another shock. Framed there in the grey, early morning light of the door, my grandfather seemed to look from his eyes. I gave a quick gasp, then there was a silence in which I could hear his wheezing breath as he eyed me unperturbed. What's wrong? He said, limping into the room. I reached for the envelope. Where did this come from? I said. What is it? He said, taking it calmly from my hands. It's unstamped. Oh, yes, I saw it myself, he said. I reckon somebody put it in the box late last night. I took it out with the regular mail. Is it something that wasn't for you? No, I said, avoiding his eyes. But, it isn't dated. I was wondering when it arrived, why are you staring at me? Because looks to me like you've seen a ghost. You feel sick? It's nothing, I said. Just a slight upset. There was an awkward silence. He stood there and I forced myself to look at his eyes again, finding my grandfather gone, leaving only the searching calm. I said, sit down a second, Brother Tarp. Since you're here I'd like to ask you a question. Sure, he said, dropping into a chair. Go ahead. Brother Tarp, you get around and know the members, how do they really feel about me? He cocked his head. Why, sure, they think you're going to make a real leader, but... Ain't no buts, that's what they think and I don't mind telling you. But what about the others? What others? The ones who don't think so much of me? Them's the ones I haven't heard about, son. But I must have some enemies, I said. Sure, I guess everybody has them but I never heard of anybody here in the Brotherhood not liking you. As far as folks up here is concerned they think you're it. You heard any different? No, but I was wondering. I've been going along taking them so much for granted that I thought I'd better check so that I can keep their support. Well, you don't have to worry. So far, nearly everything you had anything to do with has turned out to be what the folks like, even things some of them resisted. Take that there he said, pointing to the wall near my desk. It was a symbolic poster of a group of heroic figures, an American Indian couple, representing the dispossessed past, a blonde brother, in overalls, and a leading Irish sister, representing the dispossessed present, and brother Todd Clifton and a young white couple, it had been felt unwise simply to show Clifton and the girl, surrounded by a group of children of mixed races, representing the future a color photograph of bright skin texture and smooth contrast. So? I said, staring at the legend, after the struggle, the rainbow of America's future well, when you first suggested it, some of the members was against you. That's certainly true. Show, and they raised the devil about the youth members going into the subways and sticking them up in place of them constipation ads and things, but do you know what they doing now? I guess they're holding it against me because some of the kids were arrested, I said. Holding it against you? Hell, they going around bragging about it. But what I was about to say is they taking them rainbow pictures and tacking them to their walls along with God bless our home and the Lord's prayer. They're crazy about it. And same way with the hot footers and all that. You don't have to worry, son. They might resist some of your ideas. But when the deal goes down, they with you right on down to the ground. The only enemies you likely to have is somebody on the outside who's jealous to see you spring up all of a sudden and start to doing some of the things what should have been done years ago. And what do you care when some folks start knocking you? It's a sign you're getting some place. I'd like to believe so, Brother Tarp, I said. As long as I have the people with me I'll believe in what I'm doing. That's right he said. When things get rough it kind of helps to know you got support, his voice broke off and he seemed to stare down at me, although he faced me at eye level at Chris's the desk. What is it, Brother Tarp? You from down south, ain't you, son? Yes, I said. He turned in his chair, sliding one hand into his pocket as he rested his chin upon the other. I don't really have the words to say what just come into my head, son. You see, I was down there for a long time before I come up here, and when I did come up they was after me. What I mean is, I had to escape, I had to come a-running. I guess I did too, in a way, I said. 
You mean they were after you too? Not really, Brother Tarp, I just feel that way. Well this ain't exactly the same thing, he said. You notice this limp I got? Yes. Well, I wasn't always lame, and I'm not really now cause the doctors can't find anything wrong with that leg. They say it's sound as a piece of steel. What I mean is I got this limp from dragging a chain. I couldn't see it in his face or hear it in his speech, yet I knew he was neither lying nor trying to shock me. I shook my head. Sure, he said. Nobody knows that about me, they just think I got rheumatism. But it was that chain and after 19 years I haven't been able to stop dragging my leg. 19 years. 19 years, 6 months and 2 days. And what I did wasn't much, that is, it wasn't much when I did it. But after all that time it changed into something else and it seemed to be as bad as they said it was. All that time made it bad. I paid for it with everything I had but my life. I lost my wife and my boys and my piece of land. So what started out as an argument between a couple of men turned out to be a crime worth 19 years of my life. What on earth did you do, Brother Tarp? I said no to a man who wanted to take something from me, that's what it cost me for saying no and even now the debt ain't fully paid and will never be paid in their terms. A pain throbbed in my throat and I felt a kind of numb despair. 19 years. And here he was talking quietly to me and this no doubt the first time he tried to tell anyone about it. But why me, I thought, why pick me? I said no, he said. I said hell, no. And I kept saying no until I broke the chain and left. But how? They let me get close to the dogs once in a while, that's how. I made friends with them dogs and I waited. Down there you really learn how to wait. I waited 19 years and then one morning when the river was flooding I left. They thought I was one of them who got drowned when the levee broke, but I done broke the chain and gone. I was standing in the mud holding a long-handled shovel and I asked myself, Tarp, can you make it? And inside me I said yes, all that water and mud and rain said yes, and I took off. Suddenly he gave a laugh so gay it startled me. I'm telling it better than I ever thought I could, he said, fishing in his pocket and removing something that looked like an oilskin tobacco pouch, from which he removed an object wrapped in a handkerchief. I've been looking for freedom ever since, son. And sometimes I've done all right. Up to these here hard times I did very well, considering that I'm a man whose health is not too good. But even when times were best for me I remembered. Because I didn't want to forget those 19 years I just kind of held on to this as a keepsake and a reminder. He was unwrapping the object now and I watched his old man's hands. I'd like to pass it on to you, son. There, he said, handing it to me. Funny thing to give somebody, but I think it's got a heap of signifying wrapped up in it and it might help you remember what we're really fighting against. I don't think of it in terms of but two words, yes and no, but it signifies a heap more. I saw him place his hand on the desk. Brother, he said, calling me brother for the first time, I want you to take it. I guess it's a kind of luck piece. Anyway, it's the one I filed to get away. I took it in my hand, a thick, dark, oily piece of filed steel that had been twisted open and forced partly back into place, on which I saw marks that might have been made by the blade of a hatchet. It was such a link as I had seen on Bledsoe's desk, only while that one had been smooth, tarps bore the marks of haste and violence, looking as though it had been attacked and conquered before it stubbornly yielded. I looked at him and shook my head as he watched me inscrutably. Finding no words to ask him more about it, I slipped the link over my knuckles and struck it sharply against the desk. Brother Tarp chuckled. Now there's a way I never thought of using it, he said. It's pretty good. It's pretty good. But why do you give it to me, Brother Tarp? Because I have to, I guess. Now don't go trying to get me to say what I can't. You're the talker. Not me, he said, getting up and limping toward the door. It was lucky to me and I think it might be lucky to you. You just keep it with you and look at it once in a while. Course, if you get tired of it, why, give it back. Oh, 
No, I called after him, I want it and I think I understand. Thanks for giving it to me. I looked at the dark band of metal against my fist and dropped it upon the anonymous letter. I neither wanted it nor knew what to do with it, although there was no question of keeping it if for no other reason than that I felt that Brother Tarp's gesture in offering it was of some deeply felt significance which I was compelled to respect. Something, perhaps, like a man passing on to his son his own father's watch, which the son accepted not because he wanted the old-fashioned timepiece for itself but because of the overtones of unstated seriousness and solemnity of the paternal gesture which at once joined him with his ancestors, marked a high point of his present, and promised a concreteness to his nebulous and chaotic future. And now I remembered that if I had returned home instead of coming north my father would have given me my grandfather's old-fashioned Hamilton, with its long, burr-headed winding stem. Well, so my brother would get it and I'd never wanted it anyway. What were they doing now, I brooded, suddenly sick for home. I could feel the air from the window hot against my neck now as through the smell of morning coffee I heard a throaty voice singing with a mixture of laughter and solemnity, don't come early in the morning neither in the heat of the day but come in the sweet cool of the evening and wash my sins away. A whole series of memories started to well up, but I threw them off. There was no time for memory, for all its images were of times past. There had been only a few minutes from the time that I'd called in Brother Tarp about the letter and his leaving, but it seemed as though I'd plunged down a well of years. I looked calmly now at the writing which, for a moment, had shaken my total structure of certainty, and was glad that Brother Tarp had been there to be called rather than Clifton or some of the others before whom I would have been ashamed of my panic. Instead he'd left me soberly confident. Perhaps from the shock of seeming to see my grandfather looking through Tarp's eyes, perhaps through the calmness of his voice alone, or perhaps through his story and his link of chain, he had restored my perspective. He's right, I thought, whoever sent the message is trying to confuse me, some enemy is trying to halt our progress by destroying my faith through touching upon my old southern distrust, our fear of white betrayal. It was as though he had learned of my experience with Bledsoe's letters and was trying to use that knowledge to destroy not only me but the whole brotherhood. Yet that was impossible, no one knew that story who knew me now. It was simply an obscene coincidence. If only I could get my hands upon his stupid throat. Here in the brotherhood was the one place in the country where we were free and given the greatest encouragement to use our abilities, and he was trying to destroy it. No. It wasn't me he was worrying about becoming too big, it was the Brotherhood. And becoming big was exactly what the Brotherhood wanted. Hadn't I just received orders to submit ideas for organizing more people? And a white man's world was just what the Brotherhood was against. We were dedicated to building a world of Brotherhood. But who had sent it, Ras the Exhorter? No, it wasn't like him. He was more direct and absolutely against any collaboration between blacks and whites. It was someone else, someone more insidious than Rass. But who, I wondered, forcing it below my consciousness as I turned to the tasks at hand. The morning began with people asking my advice on how to secure relief, members coming in for instructions for small committee meetings being held in corners of the large hall, and I had just dismissed a woman seeking to free her husband who had been jailed for beating her, when Brother Restram entered the room. I returned his greeting and watched him ease into a chair, his eyes sweeping over my desk with uneasiness. He seemed to possess some kind of authority in the Brotherhood, but his exact function was unclear. He was caught I felt, something of a meddler. And hardly had he settled himself when he stared at my desk, saying, What you got there, brother? And pointed toward a pile of my papers. I leaned slowly back in my chair, looking him in the eye. That's my work, I said coldly, determined to stop any interference from the start. But I mean that, he said, pointing, his eyes beginning to blaze, that there. It's work, I said, all my work. Is that too? He said, pointing to Brother Tarp's leg link. That's just a personal present, brother, I said. What could I do for you? That ain't what I asked you, brother. What is it? 
I picked up the link and held it toward him, the metal oily and strangely skin-like now with the slanting sun entering the window. Would you care to examine it, brother? One of our members wore it 19 years on the chain gang. Hell, no. He recoiled. I mean, no, thank you. In fact, brother, I don't think we ought to have such things around. You think so, I said. And just why? Because I don't think we ought to dramatize our differences. I'm not dramatizing anything, it's my personal property that happens to be lying on my desk. But people can see it. That's true, I said. But I think it's a good reminder of what our movement is fighting against. No, Sue. He said, shaking his head, no, Sue. That's the worst kind of thing for brotherhood because we want to make folks think of the things we have in common. That's what makes for brotherhood. We have to change this way we have of always talking about how different we are. In the brotherhood we are all brothers. I was amused. He was obviously disturbed by something deeper than a need to forget differences. Fear was in his eyes. I never thought of it in just that way, brother, I said, dangling the iron between my finger and thumb. But you want to think about it he said. We have to discipline ourselves. Things that don't make for brotherhood have to be rooted out. We have enemies, you know. I watch everything I do and say so as to be sure that I don't upset the brotherhood, cause this is a wonderful movement, brother, and we have to keep it that way. We have to watch ourselves, brother. You know what I mean? Too often we're liable to forget that this is something that's a privilege to belong to. We're liable to say things that don't do nothing but make for more misunderstanding. What's driving him, I thought, what's all this to do with me? Could he have sent me the note? Dropping the iron I fished the anonymous note from beneath the pile and held it by a corner, so that the slanting sun shone through the page and outlined the scrawling letters. I watched him intently. He was leaning upon the desk now, looking at the page but with no recognition in his eyes. I dropped the page upon the chain, more disappointed than relieved. Between you and me, brother, he said, there are those amongst us who don't really believe in brotherhood. Oh? You damn right they don't. They're just in it to use it for their own ends. Some call you brother to your face and the minute you turn your back, you're a black son of a bitch. You got to watch them. I haven't encountered any of that, brother, I said. You will. There's lots of poison around. Some don't want to shake your hand and some don't like the idea of seeing too much of you, but goddammit, in the brotherhood they gotta. I looked at him. It had never occurred to me that the brotherhood could force anyone to shake my hand, and that he found satisfaction that it could was both shocking and distasteful. Suddenly he laughed. Yes, damn it, they gotta. Me, I don't let them get away with nothing. If they going to be brothers let them be brothers. Oh, but I'm fair, he said, his face suddenly self-righteous. I'm fair. I ask myself every day, what are you doing against brotherhood? And when I find it, I root it out, I burn it out like a man cauterizing a mad dog bite. This business of being a brother is a full-time job. You have to be pure in heart, and you have to be disciplined in body and mind. Brother. You understand what I mean? Yes, I think I do, I said. Some folks feel that way about their religion. Religion? He blinked his eyes. Folks like me and you is full of distrust, he said. We been corrupted till it's hard for some of us to believe in brotherhood. And some even want revenge. That's what I'm talking about. We have to root it out. We have to learn to trust our other brothers. After all, didn't they start the brotherhood? Didn't they come and stretch out their hand to us black men and say, we want you all for our brothers? Didn't they do it? Didn't they, now? Didn't they set out to organize us, and help fight our battle and all like that? Show they did, and we have to remember it 24 hours a day. Brotherhood. That's the word we got to keep right in front of our eyes every second. Now this brings me to why I come to see you. Brother. He sat back, his huge hands grasping his knees. I got a plan I want to talk over with you. What is it, brother? I said. Well, it's like this. 
I think we ought to have some way of showing what we are. We ought to have some banners and things like that. Especially for us black brothers. I see, I said, becoming interested. But why do you think this is important? Cause it helps the brotherhood, that's why. First, if you remember, when you watch our people when there's a parade or a funeral, or a dance or anything like that, they always have some kind of flags and banners even if they don't mean anything. It kind of makes the occasion seem more important like. It makes people stop look and listen. What's coming off here? But you know and I know that they ain't none of them got no true flag, except maybe Ras the Exhorter, and he claims he's Ethiopian or African. But none of us got no true flag cause that flag don't really belong to us. They want a true flag, one that's as much theirs as anybody else's. You know what I mean? Yes. I think I do, I said, remembering that there was always that sense in me of being apart when the flag went by. It had been a reminder, until I'd found the Brotherhood, that my star was not yet there. Sure, you know, Brother Restrum said. Everybody wants a flag. We need a flag that stands for Brotherhood, and we need a sign we can wear. A sign? You know, a pin or a button. You mean an emblem? That's it something we can wear, a pin or something like that. So that when a brother meets a brother they can know it. That way that thing what happened to brother Todd Clifton wouldn't have happened. What wouldn't have happened? He sat back. Don't you know about it? I don't know what you mean. It's something that's best forgot about, he said, leaning close, his big hands gripped and stretched before him. But you see, there was a rally and some hoodlums tried to break up the meeting and in the fighting brother Todd Clifton got hold to one of the white brothers by mistake and was beating him, thought he was one of the hoodlums, he said. Things like that is bad, brother, very bad. But with some of these emblems, things like that wouldn't happen. So that actually happened, I said. Sure did. That brother Clifton goes wild when he gets mad. But what do you think of my idea? I think it should be brought to the attention of the committee. I said guardedly, as the phone rang. Excuse me a moment, brother, I said. It was the editor of a new picture magazine requesting an interview of one of our most successful young men. That's very flattering, I said, but I'm afraid I'm too busy for an interview. I suggest, however, that you interview our youth leader, brother Todd Clifton, you'll find him a much more interesting subject. No, no. Restrum said shaking his head violently as the editor said, but we want you. You've, and you know, I interrupted, our work is considered very controversial, certainly by some. That's exactly why we want you. You've become identified with that controversy and it's our job to bring such subjects to the eyes of our readers. But so has Brother Clifton, I said. No, sir, you're the man and you owe it to our youth to allow us to tell them your story he said, as I watched Brother Restrum leaning forward. We feel that they should be encouraged to keep fighting towards success. After all, you're one of the latest to fight his way to the top. We need all the heroes we can get. But, please, I laughed over the phone, I'm no hero and I'm far from the top, I'm a Kajina machine. We here in the Brotherhood work as a unit, I said, seeing Brother Restrum nod his head in agreement. But you can't get around the fact that you're the first of our people to attract attention to it, can you now? Brother Clifton was active at least three years before me. Besides, it isn't that simple. Individuals don't count for much, it's what the group wants, what the group does. Everyone here submerges his personal ambitions for the common achievement. Good. That's very good. People want to hear that. Our people need to have someone say that to them. Why don't you let me send out an interviewer? I'll have her there in 20 minutes. You're very insistent, but I'm very busy, I said. And if Brother Restrum hadn't been wigwagging, trying to tell me what to say I would have refused. Instead, I consented. Perhaps, I thought, a little friendly publicity wouldn't hurt. Such a magazine would reach many timid souls living far from the sound of our voices. I had only to remember to say little about my past. I'm sorry for this interruption, brother, I said, 
putting down the phone and looking into his curious eyes. I'll bring your idea to the attention of the committee as quickly as possible. I stood to discourage further talk and he got up, fairly bursting to continue. Well, I've got to see some other brothers myself, he said, I'll be seeing you soon. Anytime, I said, avoiding his hand by picking up some papers. Going out, he turned with his hand on the door frame, frowning. And, brother, don't forget what I said about that thing you got on your desk. Things like that don't do nothing but cause confusion. They ought to be kept out of sight. I was glad to see him go. The idea of his trying to tell me what to say in a conversation only part of which he could have heard. And it was obvious that he disliked Clifton. Well, I disliked him. And all that foolishness and fear over the leg chain. Tarp had worn it for nineteen years and could laugh, but this big, then I forgot Brother Restroom until about two weeks later at our downtown headquarters, where a meeting had been called to discuss strategy. Everyone had arrived before me. Long benches were arranged at one side of the room, which was hot and filled with smoke. Usually such meetings sounded like a prize fight or a smoker, but now everyone was silent. The White brothers looked uncomfortable and some of the Harlem brothers belligerent. Nor did they leave me time to think about it. No sooner had I apologized for my lateness than Brother Jack struck the table with his gavel, addressing his first remarks to me. Brother. There seems to be a serious misunderstanding among some of the brothers concerning your work and recent conduct, he said. I stared at him blankly, my mind groping for connections. I'm sorry, Brother Jack, I said, but I don't understand. You mean there's something wrong with my work? So it seems, he said, his face completely neutral. Certain charges have just been made. Charges? Have I failed to carry out some directive? About that there seems to be some doubt. But we'd better let Brother Restrum speak of this, he said. Brother Restrum. I was shocked. He hadn't been around since our talk, and I looked across the table into his evasive face, seeing him stand with a slouch, a rolled paper protruding from his pocket. Yes, brothers, he said, I brought charges, much as I hated to have to do it but I've been watching the way things have been going and I've decided that if they don't stop soon, this brother is going to make a fool out of the brotherhood. There were some sounds of protest. Yes, I said it and I mean it. This here brother constitutes one of the greatest dangers ever confronted by our movement. I looked at Brother Jack, his eyes were sparkling. I seemed to see traces of a smile as he scribbled something on a pad. I was becoming very hot. Be more specific, brother, brother Garnet, a white brother, said. These are serious charges and we all know that the brother's work has been splendid. Be specific. Show, I'll be specific, Restrum boomed, suddenly whipping the paper from his pocket, unrolling it and throwing it on the table. This here's what I mean. I took a step forward, it was a portrait of me looking out from a magazine page. Where did that come from? I said. That's it, he boomed. Make out like you never seen it. But I haven't, I said. I really haven't. Don't lie to these white brothers. Don't lie. I'm not lying. I never saw it before in my life. But suppose I had, what's wrong with it? You know what's wrong? Restrum said. Look, I don't know anything. What's on your mind? You have us all here, so if you have anything to say, Please get it over with. Brothers, this man is a, a, opportunist. All you got to do is read this article to see. I charge this man with using the Brotherhood movement to advance his own selfish interests. Article? Then I remembered the interview which I had forgotten. I met the eyes of the others as they looked from me to Restrum. And what does it say about us? Brother Jack said, pointing to the magazine. Say? Restrum said. It doesn't say anything. It's all about him. What he thinks, what he does, what he's going to do. Not a word about the rest of us who's been building the movement before he was ever heard of. Look at it, if you think I'm lying. Look at it. Brother Jack turned to me. Is this true? I haven't read it, I said. I had forgotten that I was interviewed. But you remember it now. 
Brother Jack said. Yes, I do now. And he happened to be in the office when the appointment was made. They were silent. Hell, Brother Jack, Restrom said, it's right here in black and white. He's trying to give people the idea that he's the whole Brotherhood movement. I'm doing nothing of the sort. I tried to get the editor to interview Brother Todd Clifton, you know that. Since you know so little about what I'm doing, why not tell the brothers what you're up to? I'm exposing a double dealer, that's what I'm doing. I'm exposing you. Brothers, this man is a pure de-opportunist. All right, I said, expose me if you can, but stop the slander. I'll expose you, all right, he said, sticking out his chin. I'm going to. He's doing everything I said, brothers. And I'll tell you something else, he's trying to sew things up so that the members won't move unless he tells them to. Look at a few weeks ago when he was off in Philly. We tried to get a rally going and what happens? Only about 200 people turned out. He's trying to train them so they won't listen to no one but him. But, brother, didn't we decide that the appeal had been improperly phrased? A brother interrupted. Yeah, I know, but that wasn't it. But the committee analyzed the appeal and, I know, brothers, and I don't aim to dispute the committee. But, brothers, it just seems that way cause you don't know this man. He works in the dark, he's got some kind of plot. What kind of plot? One of the brothers said, leaning across the table. Just a plot, Restrom said. He aims to control the movement uptown. He wants to be a dictator. The room was silent except for the humming of fans. They looked at him with a new concern. These are very serious charges, brother. Two brothers said in unison. Serious? I know they're serious. That's how come I brought them. This opportunist thinks that because he's got a little more education he's better than anybody else. He's what Brother Jack calls a petty, petty individualist. He struck the conference table with his fist, his eyes showing small and round in his taut face. I wanted to punch that face. It no longer seemed real but a mask behind which the real face was probably laughing, both at me and at the others. For he couldn't believe what he had said. It just wasn't possible. He was the plotter and from the serious looks on the committee's faces he was getting away with it. Now several brothers started to speak at once, and Brother Jack knocked for order. Brothers, please. Brother Jack said. One at a time. What do you know about this article? He said to me, not very much, I said. The editor of the magazine called to say he was sending a reporter up for an interview. The reporter asked a few questions and took a few pictures with a little camera. That's all I know. Did you give the reporter a prepared handout? I gave her nothing except a few pieces of our official literature. I told her neither what to ask me nor what to write. I naturally tried to cooperate. If an article about me would help make friends for the movement I felt it was my duty. Brothers, this thing was ranged, Restrom said. I tell you this opportunist had that reporter sent up there. He had her sent up and he told her what to write. That's a contemptible lie, I said. You are present and you know I tried to get them to interview Brother Clifton. Who's a lie? You're a liar and a fat-mouthed scoundrel. You're a liar and no brother of mine. Now he's calling me names. Brothers, you heard him. Let's not lose our tempers, Brother Jack said calmly. Brother Restrom, you've made serious charges. Can you prove them? I can prove them. All you have to do is read the magazine and prove them for yourself, it will be read. And what else? All you have to do is listen to folks in Harlem. All they talk about is him. Never nothing about what the rest of us do. I tell you. Brothers, this man constitutes a danger to the people of Harlem. He ought to be thrown out. That is for the committee to decide, Brother Jack said. Then to me, and what have you to say in your defense, brother? In my defense? I said, nothing. I haven't anything to defend. I've tried to do my work and if the brothers don't know that, then it's too late to tell them. I don't know what's behind this but I haven't gotten around to controlling magazine writers. And I didn't realize that I was coming to stand trial either. 
This was not intended as a trial, Brother Jack said. If you're ever put on trial, and I hope you'll never be, you'll know it. Meantime, since this is an emergency the committee asks that you leave the room while we read and discuss the questioned interview. I left the room and went into a vacant office, boiling with anger and disgust. Restroom had snatched me back to the south in the midst of one of the top brotherhood committees and I felt naked. I could have throttled him, forcing me to take part in a childish dispute before the others. Yet I had to fight him as I could, in terms he understood, even though we sounded like characters in a razor-slinging vaudeville skit. Perhaps I should mention the anonymous note, except that someone might take it to mean that I didn't have the full support of my district. If Clifton were here, he'd know how to handle this clown. Were they taking him seriously just because he was black? What was wrong with them anyway, couldn't they see that they were dealing with a clown? But I would have gone to pieces had they laughed or even smiled, I thought, for they couldn't laugh at him without laughing at me as well. Yet if they had laughed, it would have been less unreal, where the hell am I? You can come in now, a brother called to me and I went out to hear their decision. Well, Brother Jack said, we've all read the article, brother, and we're happy to report that we found it harmless enough. True, it would have been better had more wordage been given to other members of the Harlem district. But we found no evidence that you had anything to do with that. Brother Restrom was mistaken. His bland manner and the knowledge that they had wasted time to see the truth released the anger within me. I'd say that he was criminally mistaken, I said. Not criminal, overzealous, he said. To me it seems both criminal and overzealous, I said. No, brother, not criminal. But he attacked my reputation. Brother Jack smiled. Only because he was sincere, brother. He was thinking of the good of the brotherhood. But why slander me? I don't follow you, brother Jack. I'm no enemy, as he well knows. I'm a brother too, I said, seeing his smile. The brotherhood has many enemies, and we must not be too harsh with brotherly mistakes. Then I saw the foolish, abashed expression on Restrum's face and relaxed. Very well, Brother Jack, I said. I suppose I should be glad you found me innocent, concerning the magazine article, he said, stabbing the air with his finger. Something tensed in the back of my head, I got to my feet. Concerning the article? You mean to say that you believe that other pipe dream? Is everyone reading Dick Tracy these days? This is no matter of Dick Tracy, he snapped. The movement has many enemies. So now I have become an enemy, I said. What's happened to everybody? You act as though none of you has any contact with me at all. Jack looked at the table. Are you interested in our decision, brother? Oh, yes. I said. Yes, I am. I'm interested in all manner of odd behavior. Who wouldn't be, when one wild man can make a room full of what I'd come to regard as some of the best minds in the country take him seriously? Certainly, I'm interested. Otherwise I'd act like a sensible man and run out of here. There were sounds of protest and Brother Jack, his face red, rapped for order. Perhaps I should address a few words to the brother. Brother McAfee said. Go ahead, Brother Jack said thickly. Brother, we understand how you feel, Brother McAfee said, but you must understand that the movement has many enemies. This is very true, and we are forced to think of the organization at the expense of our personal feelings. The Brotherhood is bigger than all of us. None of us as individuals count when its safety is questioned and be assured that none of us have anything but goodwill toward you personally. Your work has been splendid. This is simply a matter of the safety of the organization, and it is our responsibility to make a thorough investigation of all such charges. I felt suddenly empty, there was a logic in what he said which I felt compelled to accept. They were wrong, but they had the obligation to discover their mistake. Let them go ahead they'd find that none of the charges were true and I'd be vindicated. What was all this obsession with enemies anyway? I looked into their smoke-washed faces, not since the beginning had I faced such serious doubts. Up to now I had felt a wholeness about my work and direction such as I'd never known, 
not even in my mistake in college days. Brotherhood was something to which men could give themselves completely, that was its strength and my strength, and it was this sense of wholeness that guaranteed that it would change the course of history. This I had believed with all my being, but now, though still inwardly affirming that belief, I felt a blighting hurt which prevented me from trying further to defend myself. I stood there silently, waiting their decision. Someone drummed his fingers against the table top. I heard the dry leaf rustle of onion skin papers. Be assured that you can depend upon the fairness and wisdom of the committee, Brother Tobit's voice drifted from the end of the table, but there was smoke between us and I could barely see his face. The committee has decided, Brother Jack began crisply, that until all charges have been cleared, you are to have the choice of becoming inactive in Harlem, or accepting an assignment downtown. In the latter case you are to wind up your present assignment immediately. I felt weak in my legs. You mean I am to give up my work? Unless you choose to serve the movement elsewhere. But can't you see, I said, looking from face to face and seeing the blank finality in their eyes. Your assignment, should you decide to remain active, Brother Jack said, reaching for his gavel, is to lecture downtown on the woman question. Suddenly I felt as though I had been spun like a top. The what? The woman question. My pamphlet, on the woman question in the United States, will be your guide. And now, brothers, he said, his eyes sweeping around the table, the meeting is adjourned. I stood there, hearing the rapping of his gavel echoing in my ears, thinking the woman question and searching their faces for signs of amusement listening to their voices as they filed out into the hall for the slightest sound of suppressed laughter, stood there fighting the sense that I had just been made the butt of an outrageous joke and all the more so since their faces revealed no awareness. My mind fought desperately for acceptance. Nothing would change matters. They would shift me and investigate and I, still believing, still bending to discipline, would have to accept their decision. Now was certainly no time for inactivity, not just when I was beginning to approach some of the aspects of the organization about which I knew nothing, of higher committees and the leaders who never appeared, of the sympathizers and allies in groups that seemed far removed from our concerns, not at a time when all the secrets of power and authority still shrouded from me in mystery appeared on the way toward revelation. No, despite my anger and disgust. My ambitions were too great to surrender so easily. And why should I restrict myself, segregate myself? I was a spokesman, why shouldn't I speak about women, or any other subject? Nothing lay outside the scheme of our ideology, there was a policy on everything, and my main concern was to work my way ahead in the movement. I left the building still feeling as though I had been violently spun but with optimism growing. Being removed from Harlem was a shock but one which would hurt them as much as me, for I had learned that the clue to what Harlem wanted was what I wanted, and my value to the Brotherhood was no different from the value to me of my most useful contact, it depended upon my complete frankness and honesty in stating the community's hopes and hates, fears and desires. One spoke to the committee as well as to the community. No doubt it would work much the same downtown. The new assignment was a challenge and an opportunity for testing how much of what happened in Harlem was due to my own efforts and how much to the sheer eagerness of the people themselves. And, after all, I told myself, the assignment was also proof of the committee's goodwill. For by selecting me to speak with its authority on a subject which elsewhere in our society I'd have found taboo, weren't they reaffirming their belief both in me and in the principles of brotherhood? proving that they drew no lines even when it came to women? They had to investigate the charges against me, but the assignment was their unsentimental affirmation that their belief in me was unbroken. I shivered in the hot street. I hadn't allowed the idea to take concrete form in my mind, but for a moment I had almost allowed an old, southern backwardness which I had thought dead to wreck my career. Leaving Harlem was not without its regrets, however and I couldn't bring myself to say goodbye to anyone, not even to Brother Tarp or Clifton, not to mention the others upon whom I depended for information concerning the lowest groups in the community. I simply slipped my papers into my briefcase and left as though going downtown for a meeting.